Okay, um, this, is, uh, this is joint work with uh, Amber. And um, you might wonder why I flew all the way across the world to present a paper that my co-author could have presented who's already here. This is the first paper on China that I've ever written, so I had to present it in Hong Kong. Um, it's also joint with Wyatt Brooks. It's, um, it's a paper on China, but it's not really a paper on China. China's just the application. We're after like a, a bigger topic than China. China's a big topic. Um, uh, well, G Gary went back to Lewis and Kuznets. I'm going to beat him. I'm going to go all the way back to Marshall. So uh, kind of two classical views of agglomeration. And Marshall sort of dominates uh, the policy front on agglomeration. And Marshall, in his uh, principles book, said proximity is, uh, what I mean by agglomeration is people, in the, firms in the same industry locating in the same place. And he said proximity is efficiency driven. And it comes from you know, either some concentration of demand or resources, in which case this proximity might be efficient, or it comes from some sort of external economies of scale or, or uh, thickness of input markets, in which case we might get, have underinvestment, under um, agglomeration, and so we, might, we need policies to promote those. And there is a lot of policies that promote uh, industrial clusters. Cluster initiatives, SEZs, uh, that talk about the gains from agglomeration. So that's sort of one school of thought. Going back to Marshall is uh, impressive, but just to show you this is a really big idea, I'm going to go back to Smith. And Smith had a very different view about bringing um, producers together. This is the famous quote, people of, the, well, people of the same industry seldom meet together even for merriment and diversion, but the conversation ends in a conspiracy against the public or in some contrivance to raise prices. And you know the government can't pe keep people apart, but it sure as heck shouldn't be doing policies to promote, to facilitate such assemblies, okay? Much less render them necessary. So he had sort of a negative view about what happens when you bring people in the same industry in the same location. And so this paper is not going to sort of answer the grudge match between Marshall and Smith, but what we're going to go after is sort of see whether there's any, um, anything to Smith's argument. Um, why might there be something more? If I just was motivating with a quote, that would be kind of bad, even if it's Smith. So um, proximity uh, leads to easier communication and easier observation. And that's important for collusion or, or for cooperation. So uh, for example, in tacit collusion, the Green and Porter model, famous Green and Porter model, if you can see the stuff leaving the field, the collusion never breaks down, right? It's the fact that you can't perfectly observe that breaks the collusion down. In Explicit Cartels, this book by Marshall and Marx talk about how, you know, when we think about a cartel, you just fix a price. But actual explicit cartels are much more complicated, and these guys always have to be in constant communication. So communication is very important. Uh, we're not the first empirical study to look at agglomeration and collusion. This is a paper by Gon and Hernandez that looks at hotels on interstate exits and shows that the, the hotels collude in their pricing. Uh, it's a recent paper in Restat. The other th another way to think about is this a plausible idea is just to think about the famous clusters in the United States. And the famous ones all have names, Wall Street, Motor City, Hollywood, Silicon Valley. All of these, have, these first three have been convicted of colluding. And Silicon Valley right now has an ongoing uh, federal court case of collusion, um, basically monopsonistic collusion against workers, okay? So we think that this is something um, to go after. And it's a potentially unintended side effect of pro-agglomeration policies. So what's the goals? This is a, a bigger project in this paper. The, the kind of the three goals of this ongoing project, the first thing is you can imagine it's kind of difficult to think about how are we going to disentangle um, the effects that come from uh, potentially scale economies or agglomerative economies from the effects that come from collusion. If we see the firms are very, very profitable in an area, it could be that they're colluding. It could be that they have these tremendous productivity gains from returns to scale. So the, the first question is, can we distinguish these two? And we're going to say yes. And in fact, we're going to develop and validate a, a very simple intuitive test to test uh, for collusion. It's not going to be the kind of test that you could take to a court and you know, convict people of collusion. But for our purposes, what we want to be able to do is guide development policy. And so I think it's going to be informative on that front. The, the second question is, is there evidence of collusion associated with agglomeration policies? 
And that's where we're going to go to China. We're going to answer yes. We're going to find evidence in Chinese manufacturing firms. We're going to see there's a, when you think of a cluster, I want to think you to think of a, a, a cluster of about three to six firms, not a cluster of 50 textile firms or something. So they're going to be relatively concentrated clusters. We're going to see them especially among small clusters, especially among domestic firms, and especially in more concentrated industries, so uh, higher Herfindahl indices. Um, and then we're going to find, linking this to policy, we're going to find that collusion is much more prevalent in special economic zones where these clusters have been fostered, and in particular with a government-private uh, cooperation, um, than outside. Again, this is an important, you know, the world, this is partly sponsored by the World Bank. The World Bank has an office of cluster initiatives. And if you go to their, read their literature, they think, you know, we have to get firms to cooperate. This is our goal. We want them to cooperate and basically internalize technical externalities. To, but they, the, the thought doesn't seem to cross their mind that like, if firms are going to get together to cooperate and internalize technical externalities, they're also going to internalize pecuniary externalities. Um, so you know, these, these cluster initiatives, they try to foster this cooperation. Lastly, our last question is sort of, again, this doesn't say whether these policies are bad or not. It could be that the gains vastly outweigh any sort of costs. And in fact, it could be that, that uh, you know, if you have financial frictions, that uh, too much competition can be a bad thing, right? So in, in, if it, you could have a local infant industry argument. So we're not going to say anything really about normative implications of agglomeration, unless I have time at the end. That's something for the follow-up paper, for this bigger project. Okay? OK, so let's go right to the model. Think of a very large set of industries, I, and we're going to model one particular industry that has a finite set of firms in each industry, and omega I is the set of firms. Each firm is going to produce a differentiated variety. Each firm, we're going to, be, we're going to make very explicit assumptions on demand. Um, that's sort of different than the I.O. literature tends to do, but it's going to give us strong results, and it's going to allow us to be very flexible on the production side. Uh, so each, person has, uh, each firm has a demand given by this. This is, their, this is firm N and industry I. This is some industry-specific uh, demand. You could put in a firm-specific demand, too. It doesn't change anything. We just change the units on that. This is the price of firm N relative to the other people in the industry. And sigma is the elasticity of substitution on that. So that's sort of the within, within industry substitution. PI is the aggregate price of industry I. And P is the aggregate price index, which the firm takes as given, because there's a large number of industries. And, that's, and, and gamma is going to be the between industry elasticity of substitution. And the point is to think of firms within an, in, within an industry to be much better substitutes than goods across industries. So in general, sigma is going to be larger than gamma. Okay? And we're going to just assume this demand system, but this can be derived very easily from a, a representative uh, household with nested CES preferences. Here's the firm's problem. Just take any sort of cost function you want. The firm produces with some cost function that depends on the amount of output they produce and some vector x. And x can be anything that's determined um, before the production choice. So it can be capital, it can be the, wa the prices, the wages, the land, the rental. It could be some externality, so it depends on who's around you. We can, we can incorporate anything like that. The things that we can't incorporate are sort of dynamic considerations. What we want the firms to be doing is solving a static profit maximization problem. If there's some sort of learning by doing, that would be problematic. Okay. Um, but, but otherwise, we can just write a very general cost function. And we're going to model firms as Cornell, although I'll show you we can do this at Bertrand, too. It doesn't change much at all. So what's the Cornell problem? Think of a subset of firms in an industry I that are colluding. SI is the subset, and they're maximizing their joint profits. So they're perfectly colluding. They just try to maximize the total amount of profits, and they figure they can divvy the profits uh, later on. So they choose their, this is supposed to be Y. They choose their set of produ production. Um, prices depend on how much I produce and how much everybody else produces. This is firm N's revenue. This is firm N's cost. Sum up over N. That's all your profits, right? 
uh, define some terms. The markup is price over marginal cost. Market share is going to be the of, of firm N in industry I is going to be the revenue of firm N over the total revenue in the industry. Okay? Basic definitions for, mark, for markups and market share. Now, if you take the first order condition of this problem, you basically get this. You solve this for a single firm. So make SI a singleton. It's just, you know, instead of a sum, it's just the one firm maximizing its own profits. You get that the markup is inversely related to the share of the firm. And here's the intuition. A big firm is largely competing with, an, with other industries. Okay? So if it has a large market share, it's going to charge a, it's, it knows its own demand is fairly inelastic, it's going to charge a large markup. It has a small market share, it's largely competing with the firms within the industry for market share, and so it's going to charge a, um, a lower markup. Okay? And so the, this, and the strength of this relationship is governed by the difference between these elasticities. Okay? For the cartel, we get the exact same relationship, except now that firm N's markup doesn't depend on its own share only. It thinks about its impact on, it, it's, it thinks about every other firm's share. So now it, th it, it prices basically like it's one giant firm and it's taking its sum, the total market share of the cartel into account, okay? So the only difference between how a cartel sets its markup and how a single firm sets its markup is it own share versus cartel share. The other thing you'll notice is that uh, if we have different firms have, with different market shares, they're gonna, and they're pricing independently, they're all going to charge a different markup, right? Here, if they're running as a cartel, they may charge very, they may have very different markup shares, market shares, but they're going to all charge the same markup. Okay? Now, what you can do is you can generalize our demand structure to have firm-specific elasticities. And then this won't be equal, but they'll converge. There'll be, it'll be, there'll be less variance than this um, in the cartel. OK, so here's the test. We basically take one over the markup, regress it on time fixed effects, firm fixed effects, firm share at time t, and cartel share in time t. And we can hypothesize any cartel we want and run this regression. And what's the, what are the pr predictions? If they're maximizing independently, then beta 2 should equal 0, and only my own share should matter. So beta 1 should be less than 0. Okay? If they're uh, maximizing as a perfect cartel, then you, my own share doesn't matter, except that it, it you know, goes into the overall share. But the overall share matters for my markup. And so beta 1 equals 0, and beta 2 is less than 0. This is, we wrote this, we come up with this result, and then I realized that this is basically the exa exact analogous result as one of my uh, mentors. Townsend has a risk sharing regression for anybody that does development. And basically, he looks at village risk sharing. And the question is do people maximize their own individual utility, or do they jointly maximize utility? So instead of profits, it's maximizing utility, but it's the same thing. Again, he, defining the group of risk sharing is key. He conjectures that proximity facilitates joint cooperation. We're going to do the same thing. We're going to look at firms that are in the same area and say these are more likely to cooperate and test uh, how much cooperation we can find. Townsend's test says, does consumption depend on your own income or village income? Or does it depend on your own income or village consumption? But it's an, 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 an analogous thing. And the, we're going to have similar strengths. Namely, we can be exact, totally agnostic about how they collude. And we can be totally agnostic about how they, what, what came about, how do they agglomerate, what, what were their decisions. Uh, we just get these, these two coefficients. And these two coefficients are going to encompass partially cooperative results. Now, I've talked about the two extremes of perfect collusion and perfectly independent pricing. But if we define this index, kappa, as the coefficient on uh, cluster share or cartel share over the sum of the two, that's going to be our index of competition. Okay? If beta 1 is 0, beta two, then, this is, then this is going to be equal 1. That means perfect collusion. If beta 2 is 0, this equals 0. That's perfectly independent pricing. 
And these are, this is going to be intermediate between the two. And so that's going to be some index. And there's two alternative interpretations that we show you can derive. The first is that imagine that all firms are partially colluding, and the weight they put on other firms' profits is kappa. Then you get this result. The second is to say that there's a set of firms that are perfectly colluding, and a set of firms that are completely independently colluding. And then, under some strong assumptions, admittedly, kappa equals the fraction of firms that are colluding. I don't think that either of those exactly hold, but the point is that there's an interpretation of this as an index about how important collusion is uh, in, in a particular industry or a set of data. Uh, we consider alternative types of collusion. One's a Bertrand competition instead of Cournot competition. The functional form's a little bit different, but it's basically the exact same equation uh, intuitively. Um, we look at monopsony behavior. What if they collude in the labor market, for example, rather than colluding in the output market, you get a very similar equation. But now, instead of the share in the, the, instead of market share, it ends up being what fraction of the relevant labor force does your firm hire or does your cartel hire? OK, so that's the, the theory. We'll go to data. How long do I go till? 25? Oh, OK, making good time. Uh, we're going to use the annual survey of um, Chinese industrial enterprises. I think probably everybody here is uh, familiar with this. It's got a lot of firms. It's got a big variety of industries and a big, and a big ge geographic. Uh, you know, China's a big country. It's got a lot of firms and a lot of industries, which is great data to, to look for. Um, China's also interesting because um, these special enterprise zones have played a big role, um, at least presumably, in China's development um, policy. Uh, and China's also interesting in that agglomeration, indexes of agglomeration have been rising, and markups have also been rising. Now, as a macroeconomist, that was enough to convince me, but, but Amber wanted to dig a little deeper into the, the micro data, so we'll do that. Um, we have to, to implement this, we have to estimate, that was a joke, sorry, bad one. Uh, we have to estimate markups to implement this. We don't have, we don't have data on, on marginal cost, nor do we have firm level price data. So we're going to only use DeLocker and Warshinsky's method to estimate markups. And basically, DeLocker and Warshinsky's method comes from cost minimization. Uh, basic cost minimization says that for any factor that's chosen flexibly, such that the, the uh, first order condition holds, the input bang for buck has to be equalized across factors. That leads to this. So all you need is cost minimization. If you pre-multiply by the amount of the factor, over revenues, then you get this equation, and you re, re um, I know I'm going through quickly in the last uh, algebra, but we don't have a ton of time. Basically take XBL, that's labor. I want to take the elasticity of output with respect to labor over labor's share. This is effectively Hall's way of estimating markups, too. Um, if the elasticity is greatly bigger than the payment share to labor, that's a high markup. Okay? That's how we're going to. Uh, estimate markups. Uh, in order to do that, we have to estimate the elasticity of output with respect to labor. We use sort of the cutting edge technology, Ackerberg of Caves and Frazier uh, to do that. I don't have time to go through it, but we estimate markups. Uh, and then we're going to consider several cases. The first is we want to validate this test. And now look at firms that are owned by the same parent. These firms ought to be incorporating their, their impacts on other firms because you know, if they're not colluding, the manager should be fired immediately, right? Uh, so we look at affiliates owned by the same parent firm. That's one example. And the second example we look at is state-owned enterprises in the sense that the government owns all of the state-owned enterprises. Okay. Then we're going to look at uh, the full uh, Chinese economy in terms of sets of firms. So with, uh, all clusters, all industries, all locations, we're going to get some mixed results. We're, when you look at the economy overall, you don't get real strong evidence of collusion. Then we're going to look at location industries with a, a low initial coefficient of variation of markups. Remember, firms that are colluding should charge very similar markups. So we go look at clusters where they're charging very similar markups in the initial year, and then we, we uh, test for collusion there, and we get much stronger evidence. 
And then we look at um, what's the impact of SEZs, and we're going to get much stronger evidence. And then if I have time, in the next six minutes, I'll get to robustness checks. Here's the result for the affiliates. This is if we just regress on firm share. This is if we regress on cluster share. And this is if we do a horse race between the two. You see the cluster share is negative and significant. The firm share is small and insignificant. Okay? So that's exactly, this is the validation test. We're picking up that these guys don't respond to their own market share, only the, the, the parent's total market share. If we look at SOZs, we see the same thing. We're going to look at different, uh, different, different aggregations of industries. This is the most disaggregate industry. And you see that here we have, a, again, a negative and statistically significant coefficient on cluster share and statistically insignificant on firm share. If we look at the, now we consider them all to be cooperating at a national level. You might think it's only the, they only uh, cooperate at a province level or a very local level, um, like uh, four digit, but we don't find that. So we find evidence of collusion at either the province level or the national level. Okay. Now let's look at the broader set of firms. This is our main exercise. Our geography, instead of thinking about uh, a, a cartel as being a set of firms owned by the same parent, we're now going to think of a cartel, potential cartel, as being a set of firms in the same industry, in the same location. And the different locations are province, cities, and counties, where counties is the smallest, provinces is the biggest. Okay. Here are the results. Just look at the horse race ones, okay? If you look at the province level, you don't have much evidence, you, you don't see strong evidence for collusion. But as you get more and more local, the coefficient on firm share goes down, the coefficient on region share goes up. So we get 0 0.029 on region share, 0 0.81 on firm share. You take that kappa index and you get something like a, a 26.4. So, so either putting a quarter weight on other firms' profit relative to my own, or 26.4% of firms are colluding. What about special economic zones? Everybody knows what special economic zones are here. I'm not going to go over. We have, they, they basically vary by time and location. So we interact special, whether or not a firm's in a special economic zone in, that, in a particular year with these. And what we find is, remember, this coefficient is negative. But if they're in a special economic zone, the, the sum total is less negative. So the, the, the weight, the coefficient on own share de is lower in a special economic zone, whereas the coefficient, I mean the magnitude, whereas the magnitude of the uh, own share in the, of the region share is higher. What does this mean? Well, when you do our little kappa estimate separately for special economic zones and non, uh, outside of special economic zones, outside you get a 10.6. Cap equals 10.6. Inside it's 45.3. So you get four times as much collusion in these special economic zones as outside the special economic zones. Yeah. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll go over this with a robustness. Yeah. So firm-specific shocks are going are gonna to look like less collusion. Um, Cluster-specific shocks are going to look like more collusion. And we're going to try to control for these um, later. Um, one thing to note already, though, I showed you with, this, with the SOEs that as I got to a local level, the collusion actually went away. Right? So, it's not, so just getting to a, low, a, more, a closer and closer geographic level doesn't always lead to an estimate with more collusion. Uh, OK, so this is in three minutes. This is the ones where they, we pre-identify. They have low, low variation in markups in the initial year. OK, here's, here's, uh, here's the results. Again, look at these, which are the horse race results. And at the county level, now, you know, this one's marginally significant. I think this is an old result. That ended up going away. I think the significance. I'm a little bit worried now. Um, but, but the coefficient size is much smaller. We, this is actually goes the wrong way, right? So this is getting an index of 100 and, uh, you know, 100 and something percent colluding. But if we just said this is zero, you know, we get a strong estimate. Incidentally, the, the, the elasticities you get out of these uh, estimates are, are completely plausible, and they compare well to estimates of elasticities 
that people get using other methods. Which are the low dispersion clusters? I mentioned this, more concentrated high Irfindahl industries, more agglomerated, more agglomerated industries. Clusters with fewer firms tend to collude more easily, less export intensive, more private domestic. Um, okay. These are some of the industries that we find uh, most overrepresented in the set of colluding firms, a set of colluding industries. Okay, what about other region specific shocks? Um, you could imagine, basically, if we run Monte Carlo with uncertainty types of things, uh, what um, Lauren sent is, is, is completely the case. So what are we going to do? We're going to add cluster controls, so region time dummies. So if we think wages or land prices are changing in these clusters, this is going to control for those. And our Monte Carlo simulations show that they control for those, and you, we, we identify kappa. And the second is we're going to use instrumental variables. So this is with the county time dummies. Again, you see before this was 0.077, now it's 0.054. This is now insignificant. Maybe this is the result I was remembering. So our results are robust to including these region time effects. It, even the, quantitatively, they're very similar. The second thing is thinking about instruments. Um, In, if we take the, the production functions in Ackerberg, Carries, and Frazier in a, a monopolistic competition, the shares are basically my own productivity over the, uh, an aggregate of everybody else's productivity. That determines my firm's share if they're uh, doing competitively. We're going to construct two instruments. This is an instrument for my own share, which is uh, everybody else's productivity on the bottom. So if everybody else is really productive, my share goes down, not because my own productivity, but because everybody else's is really productive. For the, for the cluster share, we're going to take all the firm's productivity except the ones that are in our cluster. So again, we're not using our own estimated um, productivity as an instrument, but everybody else's. And we run these regressions, and again, we find that the firm share is insignificant, and the region share is a very similar magnitude. So this is sort of another, another way. Okay, so I'm out of time. Here's the conclusions. We developed, oh, we developed a test of collusion, validated it using affiliated firms. We found that these special economic zones have higher rates of collusion. We found uh, prevalent collusion in these pre-identified uh, industrial clusters. And this is a lie. That's, we, we misread our results, and I forgot to change the slides. So. <laughs> that is absolutely not a conclusion. Okay. Okay, so this is a cool paper, I think, because let me start maybe to express the, as a macroeconomist, I, I got sometimes a bit of a frustration that uh, in general equilibrium model, we don't have so many ways to think about uh, competition because the two simplest way we, we kind of work with is uh, either we take monopolistic competition or we take perfect competition. Uh, and I think it's, uh, it's very promising too, if macroeconomists also think a bit uh, about, uh, about this issue. Uh, so, yeah, so what kind of is done in this paper? So, uh, what, what, what they have is a nested CS structure, nested CS structure that gives rise to this demand. Uh, where we have the relative prices of, of an individual firm with, uh, relative to the industry uh, aggregator, and then the uh, relative price of this industry relative to the total uh, price uh, index. Uh, and clearly those elasticities are constrained in an in a empirically relevant way. Uh, and then kind of the neat way is if you derive the optimal markup in this setting, is that you get this kind of uh, equation. So clearly the assumption here is that uh, firms internalize that if they adjust their price, this has an effect on the uh, industry uh, price index. So firms internalize this, and that's why the market share matters, because uh, kind of the monopolistic uh, competition uh, setting is basically the limit where this share goes to uh, zero. So uh, we have a unit interval of, of firms, and, and firms don't internalize that uh, how they set their, their price affects also the, uh, the price index of the industry. 
clearly, if they internalize it, you get this expression, and you get this expression no matter, uh, you get just either the individual share or for a car cartel, you get uh, the share of the cartel. Uh, and then the paper uh, takes this equation and tries to uh, estimate it in the data uh, and see uh, whether those co coefficients are uh, more significant for individual shares or for uh, shares of cartel, where cartel is defined according to different measures. And what is quite nice is, is it takes even the function form of this equation uh, uh, seriously, right? So it's really kind of regressing the uh, inverse markup in a, in a linear way, clearly uh, including additional fixed effect and so on, uh, but I find this is kind of a quite nice uh, uh, way to go. So uh, then clearly the, the main finding are, uh, is that uh, they find evidence for, for both uh, that, that uh, well, the, the, the theoretical findings is that um, markups should increase in the firm share if uh, we don't have cartel. Uh, if we have cartel, then it should increase in the, in the share of the cartel, but not in the individual share. Uh, and markups should also converge uh, as, uh, for, for, for the case of cartels, uh, for firms within the cartel, uh, and uh, uh, market shares should diverge uh, within the cartel, for firms within the cartel. So, uh, kind of, what is nice is the theoretical robustness. So it's a simple function form. It's, it's nice. They take it seriously. They take it to the data. Uh, and they also do a bunch of theoretical robustness check in the, in the, in the paper. So uh, Joe mentioned uh, you can allow for a Bertrand uh, framework. Uh, you can allow for mono, mono, monopsony power. You can have uh, uh, firm-specific elasticities of prices. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you still get uh, qualitatively at least uh, the, the same predictions. Uh, uh, yeah, so this is quite nice. And what, what I was thought it was a bit missing is clearly the crucial assumption is this constant uh, price elasticity or constant elasticity of substitution, this nested CS framework. So yeah, I think it would be uh, worthwhile maybe if in future you can. Uh, do a bit more theoretical robustness with respect to that, because clearly, in general, uh, it can well be that the, just the market size has an effect on the on 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 the price elasticity, or uh, how rich people are has a, an effect on the price elasticity. How uh, rich demand the average consumer is has an effect on the price elasticity, and then of course uh, the the markup will be endogenous to all those things. So uh, yeah, I think in future it would be worthwhile to maybe at least discuss this uh, a little bit. So clearly then, uh, the, the crucial thing is, when you take it to the data is, of course, how do we measure this? Uh, and, the, well, this is a bit uh, trickier, of course, because we, we uh, don't observe markups, uh, we don't observe prices for those firms, uh, uh, and clearly this is uh, also tricky because firms have multiple products, they have, uh, there are quality differences, uh, and, and uh, productivity differences of the firms we don't observe. Uh, so there you use this uh, method. Uh, uh, and I have to admit that I, uh, I couldn't kind of uh, invest enough time to fully understand this method and, and also uh, uh, see uh, how reliable estimate this gives. I think it, it would be nice in, in, in future to provide a bit more uh, summary statistics about the uh, markups you get out of this estimation because, uh, yeah, so, so far I couldn't, it, it would be, of course, the, the, the results in the end rely on those measured markups. It would be nice to reassure the reader a bit uh, uh, that this uh, distribution of markups is reasonable and uh, maybe we can do some sanity checks and, and also, I thought already there, I thought maybe it would also be nice to do it for in US data, just to see uh, is there a difference? Is it reasonable? Uh, does it go in one direction? Uh, is it more dis dispersed in, in China, as we might expect? Uh, and so on and so forth. Just some sanity check and, and well, also some summary statistic about the, the obtained markups in this uh, estimation. Yeah, oops, no, I'm too far. Okay, no, I'm already there. So, yeah, so, 
yeah, I think, well, it was nice. You also had it uh, on, on actually one of the first slides uh, that uh, in future would like to go uh, more uh, towards a normative statement. Uh, because clearly what, what you find is then uh, you document kind of in a nice way that they are particularly large uh, for, uh, for these special economic zones uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, kind of in the end, uh, I was a bit wondering, yes, it's nice to document this. It's kind of interesting, of course. Uh, but clearly, can we make a bit a stronger statement in the end? Uh, is it bad and how bad is it? And clearly, it's, it's a challenging thing to do. But I think uh, this is, of course, the, the next step or uh, this should be, should be addressed at some point at, in some way. Uh, but it's also hard, of course, because clearly, I mean, in the simplest framework, you have constant average costs. And then it's just bad because you just want a zero markup. Uh, but the reality might be a bit different. You have fixed costs. You have maybe even a dynamic framework that, uh, that the incentive to innovate in R&D and in, in growth, uh, in quality improvement, uh, might be a function of markups uh, and revenues. Uh, so, in, in, and in such a framework, it's easily uh, to obtain that actually uh, the opposite is, is true. Uh, also, I was wondering, uh, particularly with the special economic zones, if if you export all those goods, suppose you kind of export 100% of those goods, then actually it's in the interest of China to have a relatively high markup. So maybe you can also discuss that uh, a little bit. So it, I mean, clearly the, uh, the, the normative statement will depend from the perspective of China, it will depend uh, whether you ex export this good or whether a local consumer is, is, uh, is uh, purchasing the, the good. Yeah. So, and, and yeah, maybe the, the last point I would like to emphasize is I was also wondering a bit, yeah, what, what are the implications uh, with respect to this misallocation literature? Because in a way it's quite similar. Uh, I mentioned already, maybe one can do the same exercise for US data uh, and then just show kind of the distribution of markups uh, for different industries, uh, for different regions and so on and so forth and compare it to US data. Uh, so, uh, and actually I think it's also, Interesting because for the misallocation literature, this is actually a challenge because the misalloc uh, misallocation literature just assumes that markups are constant and the same, identical. So maybe could it actually even explain part of the variation the misallocation literature finds in, in productivity? Okay. Um, my question is related to uh, uh, SEZ. Uh, two points. The first one is. Uh, uh, I guess that you are matching the uh, name list of the SEZ in the year 2006 with the address of the uh, firms in the data set. But the question is, uh, as I have said yesterday, uh, in the year 2003, 70% of SEZs at that time were closed in just one year. So if we only use the name list of the SEZ in the year 2006, you will miss many SEZs in the history. The other point is, special economic zones they are special. <laughs> they got many preferential, preferential uh, policies. And the existing SEZs are mainly provincial and the national level special economic zones. So the results, I, I, I'm, I'm wondering whether they are driven by those special policies or because of uh, the agglomeration effects. So that's different, right? Can I answer the last question first uh, for the SEZ? Uh, yes, uh, but we, we do not just use 2006, which is, so, so some SEZ will have the different starting year. So we do have time, time variation across SEZs, not just the cross-sectional, uh, we pick up one year. Yeah. Uh, just to clarify, but thank you for your comment. Uh, for the markup estimation part, uh, thanks to the comments uh, from uh, Lauren, uh, we yeah uh, actually for the SAF we we also have other versions using both uh, material labor as a variable input yeah, uh, but very good point. Relationships have been 
you might, I was wondering if there were kind of more kind of placebo tests you could do where you see if assume you think about uh, looking at market shares with types of firms that they couldn't possibly be colluding with. Uh, maybe just take some other firms in the area in different industries or something, and just to show that it's ro robust to different types of st story. I haven't really thought it through, but I thought that might also be a way to do some robustness checks. Is this on? Um, yeah, so um, uh, toward that end, um, if the shocks that hit firms are um, are across all industries, then our fixed effects that are sort of region time fixed effects pick this up. The problem that we have is if they're region industry time specific effects. But I think what we've done is sort of very similar to what you're talking about in terms of a placebo test, because what we've done is once you add in the region time um, uh, fixed effects, what you're basically identifying it off of is the independent industry time movements and shares, which, and the fact that those estimates are very similar when we add in the, the region time specific, fixed effect tells us that it's not coming out of, you know, um, slaughterhouses and oil refining co-moving. Does that make sense? So in some sense, that I think that's very similar to that. Uh, uh, let me think. Oh, so I guess we already answered some. So just Timo, uh, excellent uh, discussion. That's it's basically the discussion we would have written because these are all sort of the things that we have in mind. Um, with the the non CES, what we can do, what we're going to be doing, maybe we're doing it right now because why it could be working while we're here, um, is run Monte Carlo simulations when we deviate from CES. And if you imagine that the elasticity is increasing in output, then in times when I produce a lot, my share would also be big, but my uh, markup would also be big because my, the elasticity would be high. Then what we could be picking up is has absolutely nothing to do with the mechanism. The one evidence that we have in favor of our mechanism on this front without doing those Monte Carlos, I think what's gonna happen is the cap itself is still gonna be relatively stable. Um, is we look at route, we look at uh, route classification of industries, and route uh, divided industries into industries that produce homogeneous goods, industries that produce reference price goods, and industries that produce heterogeneous goods. And what we find is kappa doesn't vary too much across those industries, but our estimates of the difference between sigma and gamma uh, vary a lot. Namely, with uh, reference priced and homogeneous goods we get a big difference between those two elasticities of substitution because presumably the within elasticity is really, really high. Does that make sense? And so that is sort of consistent with the mechanism coming from something about elasticities of substitution uh, rather than non-CES uh, stuff. Um, I guess I'm out of time anyway. I can't remember the other points, but they were all good.